This is Tripwire Week in Review for week ending July 23rd. I'm Martha Kocher with Trep, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS commercial real estate and CLO markets. I'm with Manus Clancy, Senior Managing Director, and Joe McBride, Head of CRE Finance. This week, investors saw some volatility as they mulled whether the economic recovery is in jeopardy. The Delta variant is getting more attention as cases creep back up, renewing the debate over how to stem the spread. In economic data, initial unemployment claims ticked up while the number of Americans receiving benefits fell this month to the lowest level since the pandemic. And median home prices hit a new high in June as sales rebounded last month. Manus, this week, the National Bureau of Economic Research said that the recession is over and it lasted just two months. It seems that we're defying normal economic measures here. Well, we certainly are. It was an interesting week, let me start there. You know, a huge sell-off on Monday, if you turned on Squawk Box early in the day and you saw the, the future is lighting up red and the dour looks on the faces of the hosts there, you know, you had this feeling like it was 2008 all over again. I think part of that was the optics of the vice president coming out and saying, or her staff saying that she had been tested for COVID. It kind of underscored and reminded people that we have this Delta variant out there. We saw a big sell-off that day in airline stocks, cruise lines, and so forth. But by Tuesday, it was all behind us. And it really goes to a point that Joe has been making really month after month for a long time, which is as long as the Fed keeps the spigot open and as long as Congress continues to pass or at least hint at passing trillion dollar stimulus packages, multi-trillion dollar uh, infrastructure packages and, and other things, it's hard to see this market tumbling lower. And, and this really made the point for him on Tuesday. Yeah, I think there's just this implicit backstop from the Fed, but also from just the epic levels of cash in consumer and investor balance sheets right now. Right. So I think every time, you know, the market falls by two or 3%, there are hundreds of thousands or more uh, of either individual investors plus institutional investors just buying the dip, just saying, Hey, this is a chance to throw a little bit more money into the market. <laughs> Whether you like him or not, we had Bezos uh, going to quote unquote space on Tuesday morning. So I don't know if that had anything to do with anything, but Wally Funk 82 yes. years old? Wow, that's unbelievable. But anyway, that, that was just a total non sequitur that's in our outline, and it happened to happen on Tuesday before the opening bell. So I don't know if that helped at all. Well, our quip in Trip Wire was that, you know, Jeff Bezos and his brother and, and two other people went to space and were relieved that 11 minutes later they came back to Earth <laughs> while investors saw their portfolios take off and were relieved that they didn't come hurtling back down to earth later in the day. So that was our, our tongue in cheek hook for our trep wire on Tuesday. Well, Martha mentioned, and you did mention that, you know, the Delta variant and, you know, cases starting to turn upwards again. And I think that the fear on Monday was not necessarily COVID itself, but potential renewed lockdowns, renewed you know, stay at home mandates for, for kids in school and stuff like that. And I just, I have this feeling, I don't know if it's true and I'm, I'm probably completely biased that I don't think that the American public on either side of the aisle can handle or wants to handle another complete lockdown. Well, I think that was another one of the, you know, I talked about the vice president getting tested for COVID and people in the white house uh, showing symptoms and so forth, you know, that being one reminder to people, which I, you know, people weren't saying that this was a case, but I was speculating to myself that when I do talk to myself, which is frequently that, you know, I, I think that had something to do with, with that Monday sell-off. And I think the other part of it was this notion coming out of Washington this week that, there were recommendations saying that kids two and, a, two and up should be going back with 
masks and wearing them full time in the classroom. And I think this was, this was a reminder of just how painful last year was. And I think it probably made people come back and say, what's going to happen if my kid who's five or six has to sit in a classroom with a mask all day? Am I sending him back? Am I going to have to figure out daycare? Am I going to try to, you know, homeschool? How is this all going to work? And I think that, you know, I'm not trying to debate the merits of, of the issue, whether the mask should be in place or not be in place. I'm just saying that it was a, a reminder to people that we're far from out of the woods when it comes to figuring out how this is going to work and getting the logistics back to 100% of where they were 18 months ago. It's been a while since I've said this. I'm no epidemiologist, but of course cases were going to increase as the economy starts to reopen, as people start to travel, as people start to go out more, and all of these kind of restrictions relax. And a lot of young people are have been together and are getting together even more now. And most those are the ones that are less likely to be vaccinated at this point. So it's hard to know what the exact truth is at this point. I think that a lot of the news industrial complex has made a lot of money off of this whole crisis. And I think that, you know, anything that, that they can report that keeps it in the news cycle, they're going to continue to do. So many things in our life right now, it's so hard to separate fact from fiction, right? There's things you just don't really know and can't possibly understand, not as a scientist or an economist or somebody who's, you know, at, at the table when you have negotiations on economic or, or tax issues or things like that. So a lot of it is, is left to speculation. But I do think that if there's a tipping point to be had with how things go, I do think that if the teachers unions in the big cities kind of stiffen their back and say, we're not coming back to school unless everybody's vaccinated or unless everybody's wearing a mask and you have this confrontation once again, I, I think that that would be a real, real setback for many economies. So one slight digression that's semi-related. I started Twilight of the Gods, which is the third book in the Ian Toll Pacific War trilogy. Martha's looking at me like, how old are you? I'm reading World War II Navy books. But uh, the beginning prologue talks about FDR and how he dealt with the press and like some of the rules around what the press was allowed to report and not and all those types of things. And there was this esprit de corps, you know, within the press that said, you know, we want to report what we can report, but at the same time, we don't want to help the enemy. And you almost feel like, you know, we can't, we can't be doing propaganda and we can't have, you know, the government's telling us what we can report or not report. But thinking about like, let's say, for example, returning to the office in Manhattan, right? Like, I think we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but when every news story that you see from every outlet on every Twitter page and everything else is something negative about the city, about what's going on in Manhattan, about the crime, about the this, about the that... It's not helping <laughs> to get people excited to get back into the office and get to, and to get back commuting. And I think that you guys and most people would say that most of that stuff is overblown and it's not totally true. But, you know, if there was some way for the, these newspapers and outlets to get together and say, you know what, let's put the profit motive and the clickbait aside for a couple of months and tell the true story about how, you know, how the, how the city really is and try and get rid of some of this fear or anxiety of people who may are, are not really dying to get back to the office. So I don't know. That's just me on my soapbox for a minute there. A little bit, <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. Well, I'm sure we'll get a, we'll get an inbound on that one. So, you know, one of the things that president Biden commented on this week was uh, an agreement that he felt inflation was temporary, transitory, pick your word. And that's something that everybody is debating, but one of the things that I think we've talked about in previous podcasts is inflation today isn't what it used to be measured as. And so there is some distinction there that we wanted to call attention to. This ain't your grandpa's inflation. <laughs> well, if you read Barron's this, this week, it kind of is. And, and I'll get into that in a minute. I'm a loyal Barron's reader and I like, I like the old school hard copy version, uh, especially in New York. You can still get it in New York. You can't get it in South Carolina. But when I'm in New York, I like to pick it up and have my cup of coffee and read it. 
And I was reading Randall Forsyth this week, who's one of the, you know, the main columnists there. And he brought up a, an interesting angle on this. He was quoting Joseph Carson, who used to be the chief economist at Alliance Bernstein. And this was something I didn't know. I'm, I'm not in the weeds on how CPI is calculated, but this gentleman pointed out that in the seventies, house prices was included in the index. So he was pointing out that in 1979, CPI rose 11.3% and that included a 14% increase in the price of existing homes. He went on to point out that in the last 12 months here in the US, we have a CPI of 5.4%, but we no longer include uh, single family housing price inflation. And we've seen a 23% increase in existing home prices year over year. So his belief is that had the methodology stayed the same from 1979 to today, that our inflation rate would be very similar now to what it was in 1979. So we'd be talking about something in the double digits. And that's pretty scary when you think about that. And I hadn't heard that perspective, uh, but it was an interesting one. Yeah, I think what they have now is some sort of, you know, quote unquote, housing rent, you know, proxy. And it's basically the cost of living or the cost of rent and or mortgage. And I think part of the reason it's not showing up as much in CPI is because interest rates have been so dang low that the, the cost of, you know, a million dollar house in terms of mortgage payment is less than what it would have been for a $700,000 house back in 2005, you know, or, or it's the same, right? So the, the inflation in terms of how much you're paying to live somewhere is not as much as the headline numbers of house prices. Yeah, I mean, they get into more of, of what they use now, and it does seem to have a much more benign impact and a smoothing uh, factor to it. But it is, you know, one twelfth of what we saw last year in terms of the surge in home prices. I think the number they've been using is about 2%. And, and that's meaningful. Um, the one thing I would, I would move on to on the inflation conversation is, I do think that both sides to a degree are right, right? There is an element of this being transitory and there is an element of this being not transitory. So when you talk about transitory, when you're saying that rent-a-car prices or hotel rooms are up 100% year over year, well, of course they are. Nobody wanted to rent a car a year ago. Nobody wanted a hotel room a, a year ago. So if something went from 60 bucks a night to 150 a night, as we get back to normal, that's transitory, right? The, the appropriate comparison is where are we now compared to 2019, right? It, it's not a measure of inflation per se. And to that extent, transitory is the right way to look at those, those measures. Other side, the other side of it, which I think is not transitory, is once you get up to like a $15 minimum wage at a place like Walmart or Home Depot or something like that, it, it, it's very hard to go in reverse, Right? You can't take that away. So the wage inflation that we've seen and the generosity we've seen from some of these big uh, successful retailers and others, and not to mention places, you know, office workers where they're giving 7 or 10% bonuses to try to get people back to the office, you know, that doesn't go away very easily. And I think that that's permanent. You hear that, Trip? <laughs> Did you see that story about the guy who got a call from White Castle saying that they'd accepted his application? He had applied in high school like six years ago. <laughs> like they're digging through. Yes, the... I saw that. It's taking four <laughs> years for them to get back. Right, the bottom. They're White going Castle to like that McDonald's. far back. <laughs> and McDonald's. Well, it, it reminds me of two thoughts. One is that I do love White Castle, regardless of how bad it might be for me. And the later you get into the evening, sometimes the more you crave it, and the more you make bad decisions on any front. But White <laughs> Castle is, is one of them, and it also reminds me of a cousin who put himself on the giant season ticket waiting list when he was nine because he knew the waiting list was 30 years long at the time. And he called them back when he was in thirties and said, you know, what happened? I was, you know, I put myself on the waiting list when I was nine and the woman who answered the phone was still working for the giants 30 years later. So she had seen the letter and she said, that was the most adorable thing I had ever seen. It went right in the waste paper basket because we knew you were only nine Sorry to have done that to you, but God, that was, that was a lovely letter you wrote. Wow. So let's turn to retail. 
More than $3 billion in retail loans has been added to the retail purgatory category, and I think we might have to define purgatory for our listeners who may not know. Well, there's the old school way of defining purgatory and the new school, right? Most people think of purgatory as kind of a way station waiting to find out what's going to happen to you, waiting to see whether something good or bad will happen. Isn't there a great 80s movie where the right. guy defending your life, remember that movie? I don't. Where he dies and he goes to purgatory and they show him video of his life where he's like messed up and he's got to explain why these things happen. Anyway, somebody well, out there who's listening right now knows what I'm talking about. If you go to dictionary.com, it says it's a place or state of suffering inhabited by the souls of sinners who are expiating their sins before going to heaven. So that's really the old school thing. You know, maybe my grandparents thought of it that way. I think most people think about it as you're neither here nor there. Like you're waiting for the other shoe to drop. You're not sure if the other shoe is going to be, you know, a Jimmy Choo $600 pair of nice things that you can. You might be in limbo for right, those of you who remember limbo. limbo. Right. That's the, that's really what it is. So what we're talking about here, getting back to commercial real estate is more and more of these loans are finding their way into that limbo right now, which means that they are neither going through the foreclosure process yet they have not been refinanced and the lender is waiting to initiate foreclosure proceedings. I have a tough time saying that, you know, the, the, the borrower, the hotel, the uh, mall owner is a sinner here uh, and they have sins to expiate because I don't think that they really did anything wrong other than they were trapped in an industry that's kind of spiraling lower. But as Martha said, over the last three months, we've seen $3 billion worth of retail loans, mostly malls, getting added to this retail purgatory category or limbo. And, and they just kind of take time to work their way through. I'll run through a few of them for people that are, that are interested. I guess seven of the eight I'm going to mention here are malls. The Arizona Mills in Tempe, Arizona, $143 million loan. It matured this month. Um, it's on the list, right? It's, it's neither fish nor fowl at this point. The White Marsh Mall in Baltimore, Maryland, $150 million loan. It matured in May, um, part of CMBX 7. Its value was cut from $300 million uh, at securitization to $124 million this month. $190 million that loan is, right? Yes. So it is almost $70 million underwater, but it remains, like I said, neither fish nor fowl. It's just, and we hope it doesn't become fowl. You know, it muddles through uh, the Cape Cod Mall, the Newport Center in New Jersey. Uh, there, the borrower is seeking a three-year extension. Park Place Mall, Tucson, Arizona. Uh, that mall matured in May. The Rivertown Crossings in Granville, Michigan, $130 million mall. The borrower and the lender are discussing whether to modify the debt or whether it goes down the deed in lieu pathway. And the Plaza Mexico in Los Angeles that matured this month and the borrowers filed for bankruptcy a couple of months ago. So, you know, all of these things sit there and we wait to see how they, they play out. In the last uh, recession in, in the 2008 to 2012 period, what happened to these things was that some got extended and, and muddled through, uh, but a lot saw the valuation cut and then cut again and then cut further and then get resolved at, at pennies on the dollar. If you're in the CMBX space, if you're a short, what is troubling you at this point is that these loans just sit out there in purgatory sometimes for a year and you keep paying expensive uh, premiums, insurance premiums to keep your short going. And if you're a long, you love the fact that these things are just sitting out there uh, in limbo and you keep collecting these very expensive premiums for, for extended periods of time. So, you know, that's something we were watching this week. We wrote about a lot of these loans in Trep Wire, and we'll try to update this periodically. On the other side of the coin here, maybe it's, I don't know if this is a green shoot or a deal of the week. I'm kind of stepping on your territory there, Manis. But we did have uh, one super regional mall payoff at maturity, uh, the $174 million The Domain which is a super regional mall in Austin, Texas. It was slated to mature next month. It paid off this month. It had made up 30% of the collateral behind a 2011 deal. It has the types of tenants generally that are in malls that 
do okay. Dick Sporting Goods, Neiman Marcus, an orthopedic group, and actually a, a movie theater, which probably wasn't doing that great, but uh, being in Austin, Texas, probably wasn't too bad of a deal there. And by the way, I just want to mention the mixed metaphor on fish or fowl. Fowl with a W is okay. Fowl with a U, not so good. Yes, play on words. Following up on last week's extensive discussion on <laughs> who and whom. And one of my kids reminded me, and I love this part of my life. I used to be a big fan of reading them, the long Dr. Seuss books. So uh, <laughs> Those are so long, man. I, I don't love know how reading you get those, through them. Changing the voice with each character and each line. So, <laughs> you know, the Grinch and uh, Horton Hears a Who, Boyle, that dust speck, you know, that, uh, that whole thing. And one of my kids mentioned that just think how much longer it would have taken to read those books if it was all the whom's in whomville. It would have taken forever to finish that thing. Wow. Well, let's cover some other follow-up news. We had a couple of lowering of value stories that we were going to cover. Well, we did talk about the, the one in Baltimore. We have a couple of us. We have many of these, and this is probably uh, a good future segment for us to talk about again. I think we talked about it maybe six months ago, mall loans that were underwater. Two that jumped out at us in addition to the Baltimore one this week, uh, the $681 million Starwood mall portfolio, the, the collateral value was cut to only 31% of the current loan balance. The loan backs a single asset, single borrower deal. The properties behind the loan include the mall at Wellington in Wellington, Florida, MacArthur Center in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, the North Lake Mall in Charlotte, and the mall at Partridge Creek in Clinton Township, Michigan. Um, the portfolio has lost a ton of tenants over the last couple of years, a couple of Nordstroms in two of the malls. The collateral totals almost 3 million square feet. The value was lowered to 366 million in early 2020. This month, it was lowered to $210 million. So uh, again, this is a $681 million loan. So it's more than $460 million underwater at this point. So not a positive story there. I think we need to do an update on our appraised value updates. Remember, we did, uh, we did a couple of those in the first six months of COVID, but we may have to do a, a recap on those. Whom is going to do that, Joe? You or I? Who will be doing this will be me, he. Wow. <laughs> right. Wow. Yeah, we got lost in the in the matrix there for a minute. <laughs> okay, one more tripwire style uh, retail story for the week. So according to July data, the value of the uh, property, the Meadows Mall, which is a, a mall behind $129.3 million CMBS loan, the, the value of that property has been dropped. Uh, it's a 300,000 square foot retail property in Las Vegas. Uh, it's split between two deals, one 2013, one 2014 deal, and it's in CMBX 7. The collateral value was valued at 235 million back at securitization, but this month the value was lowered to 95 million. So, you know, 35, 36 million dollars underwater there. Uh, there are some positive signs. The loan had been 90 plus days delinquent. Uh, but in July, the paid through date was advanced to June of this year, and the loan's now listed in the grace period. So not sure if that means, uh, you know, the borrower is working uh, with the servicer. They have submitted a uh, modification request at this point, maybe a potential extension, something like that. For the 12 months ending September 2020, the DSCR was 1.16, occupancy of 88%, but Q1 2021, that was down to... 0.80x and 84%. So keep an eye on that one. And perhaps a sign of the times for struggling retail, the biggest global trade organization, I don't know if you guys saw this, you probably did ICSC known as, formerly known as the International Council of Shopping Centers is now renaming itself Innovating Commerce Serving Communities. And I think... They're trying to focus on the commerce aspect, the community aspect. They were a hard hit trade organization. I think they had to lay off a good number of people. 
So they are coming back strong, doing their biggest industry event in December known as Recon, where lots of people come to do deals. So hopefully they can uh, come back. Yeah, of course, uh, you know, that's that's a huge trade group. I'm sure they've been hit hard. We've worked, done a lot of work with and for them over the years. I remember, actually, let's do a throwback Thursday doo -doo 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 -doo, for Joe McBride's career. Uh, when I first started at TREP, that was one of my monthly duties was to run some queries and send some data to ICSC on retail delinquencies and some other stuff. So good on them for, I guess, innovating and pivoting. And I guess we'll see kind of where they end up. And another interesting story that is out on the YouTube wild, a gentleman by the name of Louis, Louis Rossman, he did a documentary on his phone, walked around videotaping the Chelsea area, showing the vacant storefronts. And his uh, whole premise was that there is a lot of urban decay, I think is the title of his, of his uh, documentary. I think it's an interesting man on the street approach to see firsthand how many of the businesses had to shut down during the pandemic and have not yet reopened. I think he's doing a service to two parts of the industry or two parts of the city. You know, number one is I think he's really documenting for the commercial real estate market, you know, the extent of the damage. We have been talking about it anecdotally here and you see headlines and news stories from commercial observer and others about how how deep this has gone and, and in some ways uh, you know it started even before the pandemic we started to see street level retail begin to be impacted by e-commerce rents were high uh, more and more retailers were shuttering but it was a very interesting piece that he put together and, and it's an extraordinary number of people that have viewed his his work. I, I think there is a natural progression for him to monetize something even more, which is telling people before they go back to the office, what can I count on in my neighborhood for food options when I come back to the office in September? Will my potbelly deli be open? Will five guys be open? You know, what about the street guys, right? Rafiki, can I still get Rafiki? You're giving yourself away, Manis. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Potbelly, Rafiki. There's no just salad in that mix, all yeah. right? I'm just there's, saying that much. There's no chopped. <laughs> no, and you're speaking firsthand because believe it or not, our team went back to the office just this week for several meetings. And we had our own experience, both taking mass transit and getting into the office. I just want to say that you, you mentioned that you got the man on the street concept from that uh, Rossman video. I think we should do a new segment called Man on the Street. And it'll be Manus walking around telling us uh, CMBS stories and 1970s and 80s Manhattan stories about, you know, the time he got pickpocketed near this building and, you know, and this place used to be a much different type of operation, you know, that those types of stories. I did lose 20 bucks in three card Monty when I was 14. That <laughs> reminds, you know, it just is, uh, one of the lowlights of my life being having this is where I bought all the ties I've ever owned for, for $10 and 50 cents on the corner here. <laughs> well, it's funny. I was uh, traveling from Washington DC to New York just the other day. And we were passing the white marsh mall. I was with my daughter and I was telling her that the value of the collateral, as we mentioned in an earlier segment had been cut considerably. And she was pointing out both how boring a human being I was and how often I drive by something and say, there used to be a Best Buy there. And that the loan behind that particular you know, shopping center is now 90 days delinquent. <laughs> I think the older you get, the more boring you become, especially in this Thank you. space, because it's all you, well, you and the royal you. Thank you. <laughs> Offense and so, accepted. And, and so your trip to the office was uneventful, hopefully. Well, you know, you saw a lot of things, some good, some bad. Taking it from the top, I thought that the Metro North ride was not enjoyable. You had to have the mask on the whole time. You can't read. If a guy like me who wears reading glasses, you know, you fog up the reading glasses when you try to read with a mask on. Uh, so I couldn't read my post. You know, once you got to the city, it's still a lot of 
uh, closed restaurants, but some were open. You could still get your Starbucks and you could get a beer after work. It was safe. You know, I think people, to put Joe's point from 20 minutes ago, you get this, this indication from the headlines in the news that uh, major cities are unsafe and there's homeless everywhere and there's crime and so forth. And, and maybe there is, um, but I didn't see it, right? I thought it was safe walking around the city. It was sparsely populated. You could jaywalk with ease. You know, I didn't feel like there was any imminent danger there. So anybody who's thinking I should stay home because all these things I'm seeing on the front page, you know, is, is pervasive. I, you know, I didn't see that. Yeah, I came from New Jersey. I had the same experience on New Jersey Transit. I felt uh, there were more stores, obviously, that were closed, more uh, shops that were not going to reopen, a little bit of uh, graffiti here and there, but uh, I never did I feel unsafe. Uh, and, and I even took the subway and the subway went off without a hitch. Uh, and there are a good number of people around, no tourists. So there is that, but uh, people going into work. Do you happen to notice if the street meet guys were out or no? I didn't see any street meet. I've, I would figure right now would be their moment of like, there's no, like very few of the restaurants are open for lunch. So anybody who is there is probably looking for something to eat. Figure they'd be like, you know, Bubba Gum Shrimp Corporation after the storm. Successfully woven that into about 25 podcasts. Yeah, that's episodes. good. You do that one almost Same. every time. <laughs> so turning to some of the office stories we had this week, let's start with D&B. So we have several. This will be like it always is for office. It'll be a grab bag of, of different locations and different property types. Um, Dun and Bradstreet paid $76.5 million for the town center two in Jacksonville. We told you this as a must-know several weeks ago in our must-know segment that uh, DNB was on the prowl. We said that if you owned an office property in Jacksonville, now was the time to go to uh, DNB to see if you can get on their short list of uh, places under consideration. Town Center 2 was one of the ones listed in, I guess it's WJCT was the organization that printed the, the original news story. Town Center 2 was on the short list of things that they were considering, and now that has um, turned into a reality. The property is a 220,000 square foot building uh, across the street from St. John's Town Center Mall in in Jacksonville, and we have a story about that elsewhere. Uh, other things we're talking about uh, this week, J.P. Morgan Chase is looking to move its Dallas office. Uh, that comes from Biz Journal's the, the Dallas office. Uh, J.P. Morgan looking to lease around 120,000 square feet. It looks like they're heading to 1900 North uh, Ackard Street, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. The building where they are currently located is 220 or 2200 Ross Avenue, also known as a Chase Tower. So that's, uh, you know, of interest to the Dallas market, although it doesn't result in any new space being made available. Uh, we had a big lease renewal in Chicago. Kraft Heinz renewed 160,000 square feet at the Aon Center. The real deal broke that story. Why does this matter to us? Well, it matters to us for two reasons. One is we haven't seen a whole lot of green shoots in Chicago. We've seen a lot of sublet space, uh, but not a lot of deals like this, lease renewal. So this is a good one. It's also important to us because it backs that particular property, the Aon Center. Um, several hundred million dollars worth of CMBS debt spread across five or six deals. So nice one there for the owners of that property. We did report on a big lease renewal uh, in D.C., the Washington Business Journal was reporting this. Uh, the General Services Administration signed a 300,000 square foot renewal at 500 C Street Southwest. Why does that matter to us? Well, there's a $130 million CMBS loan known as the Federal Center Plaza. It makes up almost 15% of a 2013 deal. That particular loan was kind of sitting in CMBS purgatory as investors in that 2013 deal were trying to figure out, is this a problem that's going to be forthcoming or is this going to be renewed? We now know that the lease has been renewed to 2027 and that takes some risk off the table for investors in that deal. Two office anecdotes here. One is that Apple 
pushed its reopening or its return to the office back uh, by at least a month to October. That's a lot of employees uh, not coming back to the office for another month. I also had something at Boston Properties. Uh, this is uh, coming out of Commercial Real Estate Direct, our sister company, CRENews.com. Boston Properties struck a $2 billion deal with the Canadian Pension Board and GIC, which is the Singaporean Sovereign Wealth Fund to basically, you know, double or triple down on the Boston Properties MO, which is uh, large gateway market CBD office properties. So I just found this one interesting. I think even Donut Shorts had uh, pinged me on this one saying this is kind of a little bit, I don't know if it's contrarian per se, but it's a little bit against the grain of whatever, everyone being very cautious. Yeah, we did, we did listen earlier today to the SL Green earnings call. They had released their earnings, uh, I guess yesterday, and they had their earnings call today. Uh, this is Thursday, July 22nd. We're recording this. They sounded confident there. They sounded confident that office workers are coming back. They sounded rightly pleased with how one Vanderbilt has turned out. They made a, you know, a real killing on building that tower near Grand Central Terminal. They sounded like concessions, tenant improvements, things like that, that those were leveling off or going down. They didn't sound like the kind of company that was desperate to take any deal because any deal was a good deal. That, you know, they could be patient and wait and buy their time uh, to make the right deal. And, and I thought that was interesting. They, they felt like come September, October, we were going to, you know, be back to seeing uh, a real return to the normalcy that we had pre-pandemic. Well, I can tell you for sure that, you know, this week a lot of people were back in the our office. I I was jealous. <laughs> like I I was sad that I wasn't there. You know, I was seeing people on the screen in a conference room talking to each other, shaking hands, being human beings, and. I think that that for most people, the moment, you know, the boss goes back to the office, they're going to get back to the office. So, uh, you got to be in the mix to be in the mix. And, uh, I will be in the mix in a couple of weeks. I'll give you my report, although I won't go into nearly as much detail on the mask wearing on the train. <laughs> my fail for, uh, yesterday was showing up in my typical business corporate casual thing, you know, with a collared shirt and uh, black slacks and nice shoes. And little did I know is that the prevailing attire yesterday was going to be Yacht Rock, right? People with their, uh, you know, beach shoes and capri pants. Let's move on to the deal of the week. All right, let's see what we got. We got a deal of the week and we got a must know of the week. We got both of them this time. The deal of the week, this is a New Jersey property. It's known as Monmouth Plaza. Over the years, this particular property has seen its share of bad news. It's located in Eatontown. The property is Eatontown, New Jersey, and it backs a nearly $14 million CMBS loan. Uh, several years ago, it lost Toys R Us to the liquidation process. Toys R Us was a big tenant. 50% of the space, actually almost 60 Toys R Us obviously liquidated several years ago, leaving a big hole in the collateral. Occupancy fell from 97% in 2017 to 34% in 2018 and 19. In 2019, DSCR was negative. We're happy to report that RJ Brunelli of RJ Brunelli and Company helped the landlord sign a lease for 45,000 square feet with Hackensack Meridian Health. So we should see a big uptick in that property. Um, amazingly, the borrower kept this going throughout all these bad times. The loan never became delinquent. The loan makes up uh, about one and a half percent of a 2014 CMBS deal. And, and it's, just, it's just a great story to see this thing bounce back. So occupancy should be, be bouncing back up to over 80%. Um, and as I said, RJ Brunelli gets credit for putting this together and Jeff Babakian of CBRE represented Meridian Health. So 
Uh, good news all around on that, and it does take some risk off the table for a 2014 CMBS loan. Actually, by the way, the story came from the patch. Uh, I want to give credit there where credit is due. The must know of the week, perhaps those in the local market saw this, uh, Belk, the retailer Belk is shifting to a predominantly remote work from home permanently model. The company is looking to sublet uh, almost 500,000 square feet in its Charlotte headquarters. This is a must know for two reasons. One is uh, we now see now 500,000 more square footage added to the Charlotte market. Um, that market has been seeing space come on line hand over fist for the last three years. And there's a lot of projects in the works. So now we have another half million square feet that will be coming to market. If you're in that market for space, it's good news. If you're somebody trying to get rid of space, not so good. Uh, it is also newsworthy uh, because that property that they're trying to sublet backs a big CMBS loan known as the appropriately known as the Belk headquarters loan. Um, Belk is in place until 2031 and has no termination options. Uh, but it is something to watch as we get closer to that, you know, time period when, you know, they start to face maturity, although that is very far off at this point. So shout outs of the week. Yanni M gave our team big hugs. So you guys, that's a big hug virtually for you. And he absolutely enjoyed the fact that we gave him a shout out for the deal of the week for the recent note sale. Dan McNamara commented on our episode recently where we talked about green shoots, which we periodically do almost every podcast. We had a couple of responses from folks that we shouted out last week, Black Eagle Real Estate commented and said, let's see where Joe McBride's maturing office analysis takes us through next year. So Joe would not have to report back on, on how that worked. And then BB Dogged Tenacity, the 3 2 work week is here for office. Distress is showing up in BC malls and bad retail and hotels. And then on LinkedIn, we had a number of comments. Chris C shared our special servicing report. Mark S uh, shared our work flexibility that's impacting the office market. Andrew P shared our CMBS CREPC Europe presentation. Yeah, so two, two things for me on the shout outs. First is someone, somewhere, I don't know if it was Twitter or LinkedIn or email, it said he, they had something where I was like, you know, Joe and Manis, blah, blah, blah. And then Martha, the woman who keeps it all on the rails. And you kind of failed in your duty of doing that today, Martha. But I think that's that's what makes this a lot of fun. You know I got completely. a backstop and her name is <laughs> Haley. We went completely off the rails today, but that's why this is fun. Uh, also, John C. down in Florida. Uh, I was supposed to shout him out last week. I had a really good conversation with him kind of in the private equity space. A couple of the comments from him was that, you know, the deals that they're seeing right now, like are just completely off the charts in terms of cap rate compression and, you know, yields and stuff like that. Just kind of reiterating everything that we're saying, which is asset prices are at an all time high. So uh, got to give him a shout out there. And a programming note. We have a webinar that's going to be aired next week, the State of the European CLO and CMBS Markets. If you're interested in that, it'll be Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. It'll be hosted by Vivek, who works in our London office, and he's actually been on the podcast several times. So if you're interested in that, shoot us a note, and we'll give you the details so that you can participate in watching that. And a side note, we have a number of positions open in research. So if you have someone you know who's smart, ambitious, and interested in commercial real estate finance, send us a note and we'd be happy to put them in the interview mix. I'm glad I got in under that smart and ambitious requirement, you know, several decades ago. Back then it was, can you fog a mirror? Ouch. <laughs> and, wow. and work a uh, hundred hours a week. All right. So after a year-long postponement, the Tokyo Olympics begin tomorrow and they start at 7 a.m. So if you are asleep or working, you can catch the opening ceremony rebroadcast at 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. But I'm curious, what is your must-see favorite event? 
Yeah, I don't know if I have a, a favorite event. I do love that golf is in it now, although you know, I don't know if I'm going to be able to see anything. My The state of my, you know, TV watching abilities right now and the part of the life, part of my life that I'm in is very limited, but I do have very fond memories of the Summer Olympics. Maybe it was like 94 or something. I, we had a house out in Point Lookout and I, me and my cousins would stay up until like three or four in the morning and watch whatever was on, swimming, diving, track and field, whatever it may be. And for especially now in the doldrums of, you know, no NBA, no NHL, nobody cares about baseball, no offense. Like, it's nice to be able to turn on the TV almost at any time and watch some, like, interesting sport live. So uh, I am looking forward to that, although I do feel bad for a lot of those Olympians and with all this COVID stuff and no fans and getting delayed and all that. But uh, hopefully it goes off without too many hitches. I'm going to use this opportunity to throw out a shameless chest beating moment that myself along with one of my sons and one of my daughters we are now the reigning Tuesday night trivia champions at Growler's restaurant in Tuckahoe New York and so if you see you know like an aging cranky guy walking around Westchester with a, a medal around his neck you, you'll know you're uh, at the right place and if anybody wants to take us on next Tuesday, bring it. Wow. <laughs> and with that, we'll close. Thanks to our producer, Haley Keene. Join us next week as we review what's happened during the week and how it may be impacting you. If you have a question or a comment, send an email to podcast at trep.com. For more info, visit trep.com and subscribe to the podcast with your favorite provider. Thank you for listening and stay well. All right. <laughs>